Oh. Again. I really don't know why Drew is not here as well. Request to join. And you. Okay, I'm going to be okay, 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 Hi everybody, we've got quite a few minutes to go before the um, conference webinar, um, about seven minutes. We'll probably start just after the top of the hour or two o'clock our time to just give people a chance to join. So we'll go quiet for a little while. Don't panic.
Just going to do a microphone test, ladies and gentlemen. Could you type in the chat if you can hear me? And the best way to respond is say yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. And just out of interest, I can see you're in the meeting as well, Susie Lee. Can you hear me as well? You can confirm that would be greatly appreciated. Yes, I can. Thank you very much, Susie Lee. It's good to have at least one other presenter here. We're chasing our friends from Open EDG, not that he's due. And if we have to swap around time and stuff like that, or record at a later date, we've had one presenter who has had at the very last minute another commitment thrown on them uh, from their big American employer based somewhere around West Tasman Drive in San Jose. Excuses, excuses, isn't it? And they're all looking up where West Tasman Drive is and who actually has offices there. I can tell you, it's big. <laughs> actually, last time I went was 2019. One day I have to take you to the yeah, Cisco membership, to Jason. Yeah. yeah. So everybody, Jason wants to come with me um, to San Jose to the Cisco Mothership at West Tasman Drive. You do not walk from building to building, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> ah, it's good. So just a dub another double check. Can you all hear? Um, if so, just say hello in the chat. It's nice to see some different faces this afternoon, or different virtual faces, of course. And we will kick off shortly. We're just doing a little bit of technical admin at the moment. Ambrose. Ambrose, good to see you joining us. There's a few, a few names I recognise, a few names I don't, but that's fine. We had a session this morning where we were covering um, applications of Python. This afternoon, we're sort of looking at the bigger picture, yeah, from a sort of Python community perspective. We will start shortly. And if not everybody, if everybody doesn't turn up, as I say, I can rearrange. While we're waiting, I'm going to play the geography game, and I would love you all to share not exactly, but in exactly where you are at this moment in the world. So Jason, myself, Inez and Lewis are all in sunny Milton Keynes in Buckinghamshire in the UK at the Open University head offices. Whereabouts are all of you? Yeah. Hello, London. Nearby. Okay. Kosovo, Brazil. Excellent. Sheffield. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there's nothing beautiful, more beautiful than sunny Sheffield. Almost as sunny as Glasgow. Home of North America's finest malt whiskey. Okay, I thought you said you were in Canada. <laughs> South Carolina. Edinburgh. Wow. Uxbridge. Yeah, Ux Uxbridge twinned with Heathrow Airport. <laughs> Hello. Portugal, it's good to see. Manchester, that's great. Azores. Oh, I've been to the Azores. And yeah, been to see yeah, some of your volcanic. And I've been on the island of San Miguel and the town of Ponta Delgada. I did, did, did really like the Azores. OK. Yeah, I'm talking about um, the North American continent of USA. Oh, what's going on there? Let's see. I just wanted to do a chat. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I'm just chatting to the people. J Jason wants to see who's in the chat as well. <laughs> Sunny, ha hello, Sunny Hampshire. It's been a while since I've seen you, Debbie. Well, yeah, albeit virtually. 
how's things going down at your going on down at your FB college? Uh, Scotland, UK. Hello, unknown user. Guero, Mexico. Land of the Highlander. Okay, played by a Frenchman, and the Scottish the Scottishman at, pretended he was a Spanishman. Yeah, a great film, nevertheless. Sorry, I just want to check with Jason here. Have you watched Highlander? Oh. No. <laughs> Have you watched Highlander, Lewis? Hey, I know, yeah. 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 It was great soundtrack by Queen as well, yeah, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but not this most recent version. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. We're I'm talking about the Lewis, movie. Lewis and I are teasing our poor colleagues. So <laughs> we're we're of one generation, and our colleagues in here are definitely of a different generation <laughs> all, all together. So uh, now and again, we we quote things from films or music. Yeah, music, and they just look at us like, "Shut up, old people." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, so, but it doesn't stop us, does it? No. <laughs> no, not uh, con- gen- generationally, culturally different. Ah, great with the T levels. We've been having some conversations about the T levels and Python in the earlier um, sessions, and we're also chatting to Pearson in t- the terms where they actually are quite happy that this Python course. Um, could be used as a core part of the T-levels. And we're also chatting to Pearson about the new cybersecurity um, OTQs. So, resistance is futile. Okay, yes. Come on, okay, Jason, do you know resistance is futile? I know the saying, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know where it's from. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. So, Innes has demonstrated her geek okay. credentials. <laughs> always Star Trek. Handshake across the table. <laughs> You're always Star Trek. Well done. You are now my friend. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, I can do most Star Trek quite. Okay, then why should still wait for people to join? The most important thing is how many of you are Star Trek fans and anybody that isn't may leave now. <laughs> oh, stay, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we could start an or- argument about which is the best genre of Star Trek. That that would start a flame war on here. Okay, <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I, I enjoy all of it. It's just some I enjoy more than others. I think some series went a little bit wrong for a little while, but here we are, and I'm still a nerd. And also, I like Star Wars as well. So anyway, we've just been waiting for quite a few people to join. Um, we've got over 30 participants. Uh, oh, Khan. Uh, so are you talking about the Wrath of Khan, the original one, <laughs> or the Star Trek Into Darkness rebooted universe? I mean, but I am totally with you. The Wrath of Khan is a seminal film in many ways. <laughs> Google it. <No. laughs> <laughs> We're we're all we're all mocking Jason and about Innes. Have you watched The Wrath of Khan? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to shake the It's a great film, isn't also, it? Also, the Star Trek reboot is not Star Trek. Oh, okay. It we, doesn't count. Uh, I, see. I I'm a bit open-minded on the reboot <laughs> when it does does it. Yeah, I enjoyed it, and that Into Darkness had the right mixture. <laughs> okay, that, that that that's right. Yeah. You, Russell says that we should make you watch it as onboarding as an educator in IT. Just yeah, say yes, yeah. Andrew. Yes, Andrew. That Canadian patriot has said the right thing. <laughs> 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 That's all right, Ambrose. It's been recorded and it's been shared probably in the next seven days. Um, our friends at um, Enseco will clip the recordings, but what they also do is they actually have to... Um, put in translations for Spanish and Portuguese as well, which is why it takes a little bit of time for them to come out. But once they're out, they're going to be available forever. Okay, and that's a message from our friend. Uh, So, 
Sorry, bear with me, everybody. So I'm just checking. You have sent um, Magic Visionary that link for the webinar, yes? Uh, yes. Correct, okay, correct. thank you. Sorry, we're having a conversation, everybody. It's you just still want me to, to put to Masiek? As... Yeah, because I just... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, it's OK. I, I, We're just having a test. So just making one of the sure one of the speakers is able to join in a little while. So without much more ado, we're 10 minutes in, which was to plan where Jason and I are going to present the, um, the first session. So just bear with me as I just start sharing the screen with everybody. And then I should be able to bring up the slides in a second. So can you all confirm that you can see the Siak is not in the list. But I can I can join him. Yes, please do. Okay. So can you all confirm that you can see the slides, please, in the chat? And whilst I'm doing that, I'm just going to make sure that um, Lewis has got the right email address for a presenter. So just give us one minute as I just do the final little bit of admin. So. Right. What I've done, Lewis, I've just emailed you and Masiak at the same time, so just check the CC of the email I've just sent you. Okay, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. So, may I um, call the Python conference to order? It's 10 past two on a Tuesday afternoon in a slightly grey and overclouded Milton Keynes at the moment, but we call that British weather. OK, so we're going to kick off the session by just sharing roughly the order, because obviously this will adapt according to the people speaking. Myself and Jason are going to kick off in a moment looking at our experiences of teaching Python in the world of distance learning. At half two, we've actually got Masha Witt. Sorry, apologies. Masik Witchery, who is the CEO of Open EDG, the creators of the Python Institute and the Python course, talking about the global impact. Then at roughly around 3 p.m. UK time, Lewis is going to take probably about 10, 15 minutes talking about translating Python into Portuguese and what were the challenges and the opportunity. We'll take a brief break before moving on to Susan Lee Blair Gordon, who is one of our Netacad superheroes, and she'll be discussing exactly her experiences of teaching Python in the classroom before we wrap up and just discuss some um, Python and how it will support the present as well as the future of education, a lot which we've actually been doing um, already today in the first session. So, hi, I'm Andrew Smith. Some of you already know me, and I'd like to introduce my colleague. Hello, I'm Jason Trott. Hello. <laughs> Jason's thinking, will this man leave me alone? <laughs> So we're actually in a sort of open webinar room. So when you see the camera flicker around, that's because we've actually got a 360 camera set up here. So we've also got Lewis and Innes in the room as well. And the camera will flicker over to them eventually as well when they start presenting. So. I know we've done introductions before this morning, but I'm very aware that on each of these sessions, we get slightly different people turn up to the sessions. So, hi, I'm Andrew Smith. I'm a senior lecturer in network engineering at the Open University. I lead a very, very large Cisco ASC with currently 334 educational organizations being supported by us from schools, colleges, universities, apprenticeship providers, and many others. Um, my odd background is I am a Java programmer by default, though I have learned other programming languages. 
And I tend to think sometimes in that paradigm. So when Python syntax comes along, I tend to hack at it in that programming paradigm and then wonder why Jason is laughing at me. Jason, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Uh, so I'm a lecturer in micro credentials here at the Open University. Um, I currently lead on the Python micro credential that we have. We have a, a, a suite of micro credentials here. Um, it's become one of our most successful micro credentials. Um, I also help Andrew support the uh, Cisco Academy. Um, yeah. That's a, yeah. Okay, excellent. Sorry, I've got um, <laughs> Too many Matic me <laughs> messaging me at the same time. Okay. So what we're going to do is talk about future learn first and talk about the sort of platform and um, all, all of that. So to give a little bit of context, um, the Open University, my university, um, set up by ourselves FutureLearn over 10 years ago as a MOOC platform. Back then we solely owned it and it was designed to reach students, reach learners that are not been traditionally reached. In the time that we have um, created it and put many courses on the platform, we have now sold it. Well, we sold half of it and now we've sold all of it to other private owners within the um, international education space. Why? Because it was all about development for us. Now we want others to take it on and grow it and grow it in there. Um, own manner, and it's what we call a scalable MOOC platform, massively open online courses. Now, some of you have done our free Cisco instructor training at the Open University, and you know, I've seen the way that we do distance learning. MOOC format is very much one of those formats, and to just give a sort of sense of our um, success, we um, created, actually colleagues in my school created a few years ago, um, a course on cyber security with GCHQ, which is our government security agency. Some would say they're the listening agency. However, yeah, they, they do have a role in modern um, security um, in any um, organization. And it, you could actually go in and uh, bear, bear with me as I accept the cookies because I'm not logged in, but any of you can sign up for that now and any of your students can get a digital badge. The point isn't to sell this course because it's free, but the point is that we as a school and as a university have our own platform and work with others to create content. So I've worked with Cisco on different micro-credentials. So I've used the CyberOps content and the DevNet content. Jason has been working very much on the Python content. And we also work with other providers as well. And the reality is, is that the FutureLearn platform, which we have founded this on, even though we're partnering with OpenEDG, Amazon, Cisco, and many others, um, you can see our university and actually FutureLearn has partnered with a wide range of organizations. That isn't the entire list. Um, you can actually look on there and you can see the list is actually quite extensive. And some of the courses are three hours long and some of the courses are 24 hours long and then the micro credentials are typically 100 to 150 hours long and it's about micro digestible manageable content based on the size and the need based on the subject and i've created content very much around digital literacy all the way up to very advanced networking and cyber security on this platform, which is the beauty of scalable MOOC platforms, where now the world has changed. We are digesting learning differently. Some of you have probably watched TikTok or YouTube videos that demonstrate how to do one simple but important skill all the way up to 
the much more advanced whole knowledge sets or whole qualification sets within this space. So micro credentials. I mean, the, practi the practical reality is a micro credential is a very, very up to date name to describe what is a short course by any other name. I mean, looking in the chat, um, I can see some of you have done um, some future learning courses. How many of you have ever taught a part time or an evening class course in the past? Just waiting for the chat at the moment. Yes, and it's and actually a um, future learn micro credential is kind of like that but from a remote scalable perspective. So here we run these courses over a period of time. They are degree credit bearing, albeit micro credit. And actually we offer 10 credits for undergraduate and 15 credits for postgraduate because that fits with the programs. And we design these to be delivered and supported at least three times a year. So there is a June run that's coming out soon. Jason and I have been busy sorting that out. There is an October run and then there is a March run as well. And that fits quite comfortably into our academic calendar. And again, this is an advertising. This is just sharing Yeah, the practice. Yeah, you can actually see a lot of um, micro credentials that we at the Open University and other partners of Future Learn are offering. Obviously, if we scroll down, you will spot a well known one, but you'll see other ones that if you're in the Cisco world, you will recognize. But obviously, we work with other partners. So, if I give an example of another partner, we work with the Agile Business Consortium in our school to do the ABC in agile leadership and management as well. So the name of the game is about what is right and what is actually gonna make sure that, yeah, it works for um, our different partners out there and our different students out there. So yeah, you'll recognize some of the different names and our plan in the long term is to offer a wider range. And we're quite interested in some of the developments that are coming from the world of um, open EDG and Cisco as well. And basically the micro credential model for us is based on a set of weekly sprints. So we have people like Amaminder, Susan Lee, who's going to speak later, um, supporting our students. And what we do is we interlink the platforms, but it is based on behavioral science and um, social behaviorist social learning models. So some of you may have heard of um, Bandura and social learning. And we actually base our learning design, our modality of delivery, even if it's remote, on using that and just changing the transactional distance. So rather than having the transactional distance of the teacher in the classroom delivering direct students, we plan the remote steps. So I am the lead educator in my courses. Jason, you're the lead educator in yours. You've changed the transactional distance to have support educators, then studying the course and working our way towards what's a low cost, agile model. And also what's really nice about the Python course is it also enables us to focus on the employability of the students. The students get a certificate, the students get degree credit, but the students also get practice, experience, knowledge, but more importantly, some level of understanding. And that um, poem example we gave this morning, which will be in the other recording, based around the Ning Nang Ning by Spike Milligan, is based on what that might seem like a whimsical example. We very cleverly built in layers of challenge or layers of complexity for the students to develop what is in effect their employability or their industry skills. So Jason, would you like to take over from here, please? Uh, yep, so looking at the assessment that we give students on the micro-credentials, uh, we split it into four activities. Uh, so we have the weekly module sprint 
uh, results. So on NetAcad under OpenEDG's course, there are um, weekly exams essentially for the modules. We take those results and they're worth 10% of the overall assessment. Uh, bear in mind that that's nowhere near enough to actually get any kind of passing mark on the uh, micro-credential. Um, so it's a very small percentage. They actually have to attempt the uh, assessment to get any kind of grade. Uh, we use the final assessment from, um, from OpenEDG as well. Uh, it's a practical skills assessment. Um, uh, and you have the final exam within OpenEDG as well. Uh, so together, they are 10 and 20%, so that's 30%. Our pass mark is at least 40%. Um, so just looking at the open EDG content won't get you a pass. Um, then we have the practical activity, the example from this morning with Ning Nang Nong, um, how to count ends and vowels in that poem. Uh, we have three practicals that the, the student can choose from. Uh, I think we have one on ciphers, one on uh, a poem, and one on prime numbers. Prime numbers. Uh, adding prime numbers together, I think, is what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, from a random generator? Yeah. Random generator that detects prime numbers and adds them together That's to create a crypto key. Yes. Um, so the practical element is worth 30% as well. Uh, you saw how you could vary those grades depending on the level of effort and uh, competency that the student has shown within coding. Uh, if they've used basic like methods to do the task, if they've used functions or uh, try accept statements, um, the more they use, the higher the grade they're going to get. Um, the last section, as it is like an academic assessment, we have to get them to actually write something. So we have the student explain their process um, and the documentation for their code, uh, and that's worth 40%. Um, and overall, most get 60-ish percent. Six, 60 to 70. Yeah. yeah they're, 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 they're on the, the nice side of the standard bell curve yeah. the grades. Um, but we focus on the academic writing as the, the, higher, uh, the higher percentage because it is worth 10 credits on uh, an undergrad course. Before you go to the next slide, Jason. I mean, so this this design is um, sort of designed to be cunning academically. As Jason has alluded to, the 10 and 20 percent for using the continuous assessment and the open DDG assessment, there's nothing wrong with the assessment. It's really good assessment. But if the students just did that and learned by rote, that doesn't make them degree credit worthy. So if they do that and it's worth 30 percent, we make sure it will contribute to their final grade, but will not pass them. Also, if they can write good code, that's excellent. However, the reason we get them to explain and document their code, this is long before the world of chat GPT. We want to know that they know and that they didn't get the family cat to do the coding for them. So it's that argument and that justification and that explanation that is absolutely essential here because I, I need to be confident that that student has actually produced those that work. There are other check mechanisms we use as well, but yeah, for simplicity, that is what we're doing um, here in this context. And that's quite a nice balance. It's about 30% theory, it's about 30% practical, and it's about 30 to 40% academic reflection but we get them to reflect on the work they're doing. So we're getting them to actually expand upon their practical work and explore with us why it is they did what it is and what their thinking was when they were doing it, drawing out their computational thinking. So Python, our experience with this particular micro-credential. Chase them. Uh, okay, so to, to date we have run uh, five uh, instances of this Python micro-credential. Uh, in June, we will commence the sixth 
uh, edition of it. Um, within the open universities micro credential, it's become the most uh, popular out of all of them. Um, we typically get this is slightly out of date, 250 to 300 students at the moment um, on every run that we've had. Um, and overall, we've probably reached about 1,500 uh, students across all of the runs. Um, it's popular for regional funding, so it was, it was supported by Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, so it does skew the computer science experience level of enrolling students. Um, we have a retention of around 40 percent um, on the scale of uh, MOOCs that's quite high uh, most MOOCs celebrate on five to seven percent retention um, so we are way above that um, the, OU, the OU Cisco ASC um, is MOOC based instructor training courses have an average retention of 20 to 30 percent. So you can see the the retention is expected to be low uh, and because we're getting 40 percent we're way higher than even expected. Um, we have uh, an excellent range of results from those who uh, submit at the end. Uh, so we have a self-selection bias because those that do attempt the assessment are generally the better students or have learned the most during the course. Or I would say more confidence. More confidence. Yeah. Um, so that self-selecting bias generally means that those people do quite well and we have a general median of 65 to 75 percent. Um, First class or distinction grade at the OU is 85%. So we still have that bell curve of mostly. We get excited if over 20% get above that yep. grade. By excited, questions are asked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we don't get that and we don't want that. And we are very comfortable. So I can't, I'm not going to, because it's academically confidential, we're giving out very broad mm -hmm. figures here. We're not going to show you our bell curve because that belongs to us. However, what we have found is comparable to normal undergraduate students, our Python students on the micro credential are behaving almost exactly the same as if they were students on a full time mm -hmm. degree with us or anybody else. Yeah. Next. Jason was trying to gesture to me to press the button, and I was l looking at him like. What? <laughs> um, so uh, we we gather the feedback uh, from the micro credentials, and generally it's been very positive. Um, Almost all of it's been positive. I it's think. all been yeah. positive. I mean, we're not going to say that we don't get negative yeah. feedback um, as we're dealing with one at the moment where I can't go into details. But the student who is an experienced programmer, so they say, is complaining it's a bit hard. But we get we get individuals like that. Um, so we've found that 80 percent of the respondents give us at least a five out of five. Uh, so with a small tail off down below that. Um, I mean, you know, here we've got a publicly unsolicited example of a LinkedIn post that was shared recently um, based on one of our government funded funders funded um, projects and yeah this individual is yeah really chuffed they've got the credit they've got the certificate of completion we hope they're also going to go and take the open edg certification as well um, yeah the reality for us is we're trying a scalable route to get more people to learn coding and Python for us is one of the better pathways. And because we've got the Open EDG resources and the Python Institute um, accreditation, I think this is the right route to employability and degree credit for undergraduate students who are doing a full degree or a micro credential. 
going to hand over to our good friend Magic in a moment. But do you have any questions that you would like to put in the chat forum? Well, have we all stunned you into <laughs> silence? Anybody else got any experiences of their own sort of use of future learn or um, teaching Python to degree students? OK. I'm not going to let. OK. If you're interested in the um, Cisco Educators course, email me on andrew.smith at open.ac.uk and I'm happy to have a separate sidebar conversation and I will actually put my email into the chat as well. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce you to a good friend of mine, Magic Witchery, from the Open EDG, the CEO. Magic, are you able to enable your camera and turn on your microphone? Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm able to do that. However, I just got back from Mexico, uh, lost my luggage, including shaver, and my, I'm kind of sick. So if you <laughs> forgive me, <clears throat> I will not show my beautiful face for the for this conference i i think as excuses go that was one of the more imaginative ones <laughs> okay can can everybody hear um our good friend magic on their um speakers as well excellent okay that's perfect so you've got sharing rights i'm going to just disable my settings and stop my camera briefly so you're not going to see us um, constantly appearing and I'm going to disable our microphone as well unless um, Magic asks me a question. So over to you, sir. I think it's, it will be good for you to introduce yourself. Uh, OK, I'm CEO of uh, Open Education Development Group, which includes uh, Python uh, Institute. Uh, I don't know if it's fair to share, but uh, uh, most importantly, I have been CCNA instructor since 2001. So in a way, I'm also a teacher. I've been with uh, Cisco for yeah such a long time. Uh, I don't know if that makes uh, us the introduction. Uh, so we are here to talk about Python, our courses and our certification. I think this is important to mention that uh, Python is currently absolutely most important programming language uh, by Tayobi index and by people's index. Uh, well, basically those indexes are a bit different. They are constructed differently, but as you can see, more or less they show the same thing. Python is definitely number one certification uh, for programming language certification yes in the second uh, python is number one programming language uh, uh, worldwide uh, worldwide all right so about about us uh, i think this is important to mention that we are one of the contributing uh, contributing sponsor of python programming language which means that whenever you use, you use our service, whenever you pay us something, you also contribute to make programming uh, Python programming language even better than it is uh, today. Uh, we sponsor uh, uh, also uh, PyCon a conference uh, uh, this year that was in Salt Lake City, a really, really nice, uh, huge event over, over 2000 participants. Uh, yeah, you can you can see Guido van Rossum here, and that's the main stage just before his presentation. And that's our booth, and you can see our team, like core team that is really focused on Python. Of course, we have way more people working on that. A lot of SMEs. If you really can't, well, that would be over 200 people. Uh, all right, what's what's kind of important about this conference? Uh, because I'm also going to talk about the certification, quite a lot of people came to our booth thanking us for actually getting them into the into this field, into Python programming. Uh, some of them were even introducing us to their bosses, which were also present at this conference. Uh, 
I want to share one more thing with you. Companies using our certification, and with this, you would also have a glance of companies that are using Python. When I talk about those companies, I mean that they purchase uh, our certification for employees uh, uh, to make them develop. Uh, but the truth is that there is over like tens of thousands of those companies. So, well, that slide looked a little bit weird when I put all of them, all of them here. Uh, so I kind of, you know, stripped that to this list so you'd have a brief look of basically most companies are using Python and our Python certification. All right, so we have basically uh, currently like two, like three courses, starting with Python Essentials, uh, which is like a 40 hours, more or less 40 hours course, ending with uh, PSAP certification. And just to be sure here, certification is ab absolutely optional. Like, uh, and I have to say, like, uh, I would say 90. 7% of people doing our courses, they don't get certified. So you may say that we are like 97% uh, free of charge. Uh, of course, that percentage varies from country to country. Uh, in in India, it's probably like, like 99%. In US, it's probably like 90%. Uh, but still, with these huge numbers that we have, people getting uh, this course, the number of people getting certified is uh, very big. Uh, so far, there is like several hundred thousand people certified with our certification. Uh, so Python Essentials is basically, uh, yes, you can even get a job with this certification, but basically you would rather I, um, I'm for uh, internship, you would, you would need to understand that your employee will need to invest in you, uh, even though you possess the certification already. So your journey just starts uh, here. And here you can see like entire pathway, uh, like general uh, purpose programming entry, the associate and professional professional so basically associate is the one that you would be aiming for like and really actively start looking for jobs of course we don't stop there uh, but with professional level uh, well we usually encourage that you already have some experience in programming all right so this is uh, associate level uh, course and certification uh, it's also about 40 50 minute uh, for, uh, hour 40 50 hour course uh, okay uh, I want to share one thing with you and actually it's uh, pretty much the first time I'm going to share that with anybody uh, we did survey i would say a little salary but it's not really that little we sent like a uh, uh, request to over 12000 uh, certification holders and we got like pretty nice like 1100 responses i think this is really good like majority of people rather do not respond to surveys so our uh, are people that are certified with uh, our certification they did so we wanted to figure out more about them like uh, uh, they profile at demographics as yeah um, employee employer perspective uh, most importantly benefits of certification uh, not everything is fantastic, like uh, definitely uh, most of people uh, that uh, answered our survey were male. Uh, so even though we really engaged in many initiatives uh, that, uh, you know, and encourage women to uh, start programming, I can say that there is a lot of thing, uh, a lot of work in front of us. Uh, this is kind of interesting, like 10% uh, of our responders, they were not even IT professionals. They were using uh, uh, Python for something else than being IT professional. That's that's kind of interesting. And yes, almost all of them uh, uh, recommend our certification to others. Uh, uh, certification made, uh, when I say uh, uh, 
agri or strong drug agri it's like uh, combined here uh, this is PCEP and PCAP certification so the certification made them more valuable on the job market that's what they say uh, it also in increased at their job satisfaction over 70 percent 73 77 percent uh, uh, earning certification increased their confidence uh, in abilities or in and or in professional competence, 90 percent. Uh, and also it helped them to grow their professional network. Uh, this this one is kind of interesting, uh, increased recognition and respect from colleagues, 75 percent. And to make it to make it quick, quick uh, given greater deter determination to succeed professionally that's 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 really that's really nice over like 80 85 per, uh, 85 percent uh, increase the quality and, and value of uh, work contribution contribution 82 percent work effectiveness uh, and uh, gave them idea about what they still need to learn as you say sometimes it's really good to know what we don't know and that's what we usually get from uh, from uh, certified uh, people that they say, well, I kind of knew that already, uh, but it helped them to organize everything. So they know where they are, what they still need to learn, 90%. Uh, uh, has given me better understanding of the scope of knowledge that is needed for related jobs. Uh, and also it made them more up to date with the current standard standards in my professional. And I think this slide is kind of uh, kind of important. I'm already I only want to jump to this one, but let me go through uh, slowly. So I learned new skills, obtained new competence over 50 percent. Of course, resume looks better with our certification, 65 percent. Studies became easier. Uh, I think that might be really interesting for you. And yes, this one, I found a job. I found a job like. <clears throat> like this is really, I don't know if there is any other program more efficient than, than that, making people finding jobs, but like every third person that got certified got a job. And of course we have to count people that, well, they didn't really got a job, they already have one. Uh, but this makes me really, really happy. Yeah, others got promotion in job, got salary increased, and some people and credit towards a degree. Yeah, because some universities are actually uh, giving this credit. All right, so just a few words about of what we are working on uh, right now. Uh, pretty soon you will see testing with Python. Uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, Python is widely used for testing like of course you can be like manual tester but more effectively you can be tester using uh, uh, using uh, python writing scripts data analytics with uh, with python and python for network automation all right so uh, i guess if there are like questions i would be more than happy to answer them so straight um, in, hello Magic, thank you very yeah. much for your brief but very useful presentation. Um, that, that data that you collected with all of those individuals, would you be open to, uh, not necessarily sh sharing you know, all of it, but sharing data and collaborating with other organizations to explore the employability prospects element of it? Yeah, I, I would be delighted to, of course. Uh, somebody's just asking if you can show the last slide again. I think that was a very exciting slide that you rushed through. Okay, yeah. That's a beautiful scene. <laughs> That's my uh, home, actually. Um, okay, if you can full screen that one briefly. This one, so, right? 
I'd like you're you're talking about these coming out. So Q2, Q3. How will our good friends in this community be able to access these when they appear? Uh, all of our courses are delivered with our platform, so we can go from pythoninstitute.org and find the access. Actually, all of the uh, platforms that those courses uh, are available from, well, you can start with py uh, pythoninstitute.org and find everything there. Of course, uh, our courses are delivered with netacad.com, skills for all, uh, both uh, old and the new uh, Cisco platforms and of course with uh, with you Andrew and your platforms. Yeah, but I'm not I'm not here to brag about what the Open University are up to, but that's good to share anyway. So these courses are available on Python Institute. Will the courses that you are talking about eventually be available on um, NetAcad or Skills for All? Uh, of course, it's not always my decision. Uh, I have to negotiate at, uh, with Cisco, uh, but yes, they, they really love our courses, too, so I think that will happen pretty quickly. So, so you, you, you're having a positive conversation with Giuseppe and Kamara, yes? Yes, I do, definitely. Yeah, okay. I mean, you can't promise anything, but what there is is an intent from Cisco. Um, will it be available on Future Learning in the future? Um, at the Open University, we've got some plans, but I am not in a position to share what those plans are at the moment, as we're having an or organisational strategic move towards some other developments. But all I'll say is watch this space. But meanwhile, um, it's great to see that these resources are going to be available on NetCAD. It's great that you're open to sharing um, some things as well. I mean, from your experience with the community and um, Python, how how well do you think it has gone, Magic, with working with organisations like the Open University and SECO and many others? Well, I, I would say it's, go, it's going, it's going pretty, pretty good, like, uh, really increased numbers of uh, Python enthusiasts with you uh, uh, and that number is still going uh, growing really fast so yes I'm I'm really happy to work with you and, and all of those organizations so what what would you hope to see from all of the teachers that are in this um, session today knowing that your content is freely available to all of them for free uh, well, maybe it's too much, too much to ask, uh, but I would like to sponsor all the certification, all Python certifications to all of those teachers. So if they would be willing to take this certification, that's my offer. So you will pay for the teachers in this conference, email you now and that you could actually, you will sponsor them individually for Python certification. I would love to do that. Okay, you've you've heard it here, guys, and I mean it's worth. How how much is it worth if they paid for it at commercial prices? All right, let me jump to here. All right, commercial price for entry level exam is just fifty nine dollars, but for associate it is two hundred ninety five. Okay, so, and you're offering them either of them. Am I correct? I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm offering that for free to all of the teachers that are in this conference. Excellent. Of so, yeah, um, could you put your email address or a contact email in the chat? Because obviously this is going to be recorded and there's going to be people participating afterwards and we don't want to really lose. OK, OK, I'm doing that right now. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, no. We don't want everybody else's emails. We only want Magic's emails. He's not going to email you. You're going to email him. So I'm just waiting for him. All to right. Type. So uh, I'm se I'm I'm uh, sending my email right now. Uh, yeah. I would like you to just write in the uh, title of your email uh, the name of this uh, event. 
and certification. So I would that would be easy for me to find forward that the right people so they would help you with that. OK, and the event is the Python CS for all conference and say magic will e you e don't give me your email. We don't want them. It's email him. And he's given his email. It's magic witchery at openedg.org. If you keep adding your emails, you're going to get spam from people that are confused. OK, so okay. email magic witchery and to put in the subject Python CS for all conference and he will organize um, for you a free voucher to take either the PSET or the PCAP. That that is your choice, but don't share with us your email address because in the nicest, nicest sense, we don't want it. So we're about five minutes ahead of schedule at the moment, which isn't a bad thing. Um, does anybody have any other questions of Magic Wise? We've got his somewhat busy time. Maybe I'll comment here one. Uh, in our next step, we're going to talk about Portuguese uh, version of the course. I have to say that I had this request like a lot of time past week, uh, which I spent uh, in Mexico. They did uh, a Python marathon for like 57,000 people, uh, which is like really, really huge event. Uh, and the result of this was that, yeah, we need to have a Portuguese translation. Hmm. I'd love to learn about separately, love to learn about that Python marathon. And maybe that's something that the Open University in SECO and um, Open EDG could be involved in with. And I've got the president of NSECO opposite the table from me, and he knows better than to say no, Andrew. <laughs> okay. She's smiling in agreement, which is all I need. <laughs> but no, we can we can explore opportunities, and I think um, that's quite important. And we would love to do that. I mean, we had great success years ago with the digital skills toolkit during the pandemic. Obviously, that was anomalous, but we would love to go and explore. Um, yeah, other opportunities, getting school teachers, college lecturers, university, it doesn't matter, but work together in a way that would actually enable Python. And one of the things we've been learning in some of the conversations already is um, there's a qualification called the T levels in the UK. Pearson, the awarding organisation, does the software development T level, and they're very much behind the use of the open EDG Python content. So soon we might be finding that there is a new space where this content could work quite well for 16 to 19 year old learners. So it's lots of conversations all positive, but that would be something I would love to loop you in as well on Magic so that you're aware of what we're up to. So you don't get any surprises in a year's time or a couple of years time when the United Kingdom are sending you lots of new students and certifications. OK, on that, I'd like to all of you to sort of just type in thank you to Magic, and then in about two minutes we're going to, I'm going to hand over to Lewis that's going to, who's going to talk about um, their experiences of um, translation. So what I'm going to do now um, is just a little bit of a practical moment. Lewis, are you going to share slides or just talk? No, just talk okay. and uh, just share two, two links. Okay, so you're, you're already broadcasting. Um, so you, you're going to camera and broadcast and you can easily just share via your desktop as well. So you're recording on that and you can share your desktop on your computer. Sorry, it might seem, but we just do have to do a little bit of admin because obviously we're working our way gently around the meeting room security constraints that we've got. OK, so may I start? It is all yours now, <laughs> sir. OK, so but but instead of sharing my my screen, OK, so I, I will just share with you uh, by by using the chat. I will share the two links 
One is the platform that have been used to, to do the translations of the Python course for the Portuguese. Okay, so this is the XTM. So it's it's a platform that is based again and again as as, as usually nowadays is based on artificial intelligence algorithms. So it tries first of all to translate most part of the contents. Okay, when we are talking about the translation of the entire Python course, uh, and then we of course use this platform in order to to look carefully to each sentence, each each uh, 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 item that has been translated, uh, in order to produce a high quality translation of uh, a Python course like the one that is. Uh, Produced by by Cisco. Okay, then at the same time, the partner that has been working with us on this on this task was Inlea. Okay, so I had shared also the link to this this partner. Okay, and so Inlea is a, a company that. Uh, do a lot of things, but is uh, I think a partner to, for, to, uh, of Cisco not only for translation but to several other things. And so the most important thing when you are talking about the translation like this one is that we have English English sentences, but at the same time we have lots of uh, uh, expressions, uh, Python expressions written written on the exercises and so on okay and so and that's why even when we are talking about a platform that uses artificial intelligence for the translation it's always important to have a manual translation uh, per item okay of course that in our case we are talking about uh, um, plan of execution that took approximately uh, four months okay so with with some with several meetings uh, in between okay between us in layer and Cisco because Cisco at the end is uh, the entity that is responsible to do the last checks of the entire uh, translation operation and um, so after four months and then f after a final uh, revision of all the materials and the, of the, the complete translation, translation from uh, Cisco, we handed all this uh, in a period of approximately six months. Okay, so of course that we are talking about English to Portuguese. Okay, so we have lots of, of uh, tricks when we are doing this kind of translation. But just for you to know that every time we are talking about translation like uh, like this one, okay, we may be talking about uh, four month, six month uh, work. Well, these are the most important things when we, with respect to, to translation. I don't know if there is any particular question that. I mean, from my perspective, because we're working on a different project at the moment where we're translating some content into a, a local language Welsh well wow. okay which yeah, it's got its pros and cons but our Welsh Wales is a separate nation in the UK for those of you not aware they do have their own language and they teach Welsh in high schools and they want to yeah be able to sort of yeah develop Welsh they're having some of the same challenges you experienced. What were the challenges and how did you solve them? Well, well, as I said, the, the big challenges that we have is in particular where we are, where every time we are dealing with texts that combines both English and a language like Python. Yeah. Okay. And so, when we are doing this for a Portuguese language in which we, we need to keep everything that is related with Python exactly as it is, okay, uh, that it's more tricky because the, 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 
the automatic translations, most of the time, they put some of these Python expressions also in Portuguese. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I mustn't laugh, but it is funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's funny because, if, of course, that when we have we have blocks of code, okay, then the automatic translation will most of the time it works well, okay. But when you have the expressions in the middle of text and so on, you figure out that all those expressions are also in somehow also translated to Portuguese and so on, okay. So this was probably the most problematic issue that we have been facing uh, uh, when during the translation. Okay. Um, so did you need somebody to go through and create some form of markup or markdown to yeah. protect? Yeah, that's yeah. protect the coding. Yeah. yeah, that's precisely the most important thing. So not only for, for this kind of context, but uh, in general, okay? So when we have something like that identifies, well, the structure of the text that we are dealing with, okay, Every, everything is, is easier, okay? Uh, but um, most of the times, again, we're on these uh, Python contents and Python course contents, sometimes that was not true, okay? And so the antibiotic translation uh, 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 was in somehow. So it's sort of almost need a human pre parse yeah. and then a human post parse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Another thing is that these kind of platforms, okay, like XTM and so on. So this kind of platform. Ever, so after we get the automatic translation, okay, we ha we we receive all the the items text images and so on in in cells okay in in different cells like we like like when we are, you are using excel or something okay. okay so in different cells but all the 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 pieces of text are really small okay so the, the it's the breaking the breaking phase of all this it's really uh, uh, so the the number of cells that needs to be checked and uh, translate manually translated are huge. Okay, so um, again, most of the times when we separate uh, an entire paragraph in the, these different parts of text, sometimes you lose context. Yeah. Okay. And when we are talking about the automatic translation, the context is missing, okay? And so you see things that are not related with the, the entire block of text you are dealing with. Okay. It, create, it creates a sort of grammatical gibberish. Yeah, so that in, in a nutshell, what this means is that, yes, it's tricky and uh, it's hard work because even when we are talking about a starting point, okay, based on an automatic translation, but you have lots of small items that you need to check and and, yeah. and, and translate manually or, or to correct manually, and you really need to look at all of them, okay? So you, you cannot assume that, okay, this part is okay, and that other part is not okay. So you okay, also so you need, need a proofreader, editor, and rewriter process. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, talking to our friends at another ASEA are involved in this Welsh translation, it is the syntactical context yeah. that's so easily lost. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I mean, we think we have problems just with words like centre and nature <laughs> not being spelled our way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Okay. My, my, it must be easy for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news, the good news is that after dealing with all these, let's say, uh, oh, this reality, let's say, okay, yeah. this reality, based on the kind of translations we are talking about and the kind of platform we are using. So after, uh, uh, after, Knowing exactly what are the limitations and what uh, what are the the things we are dealing with, okay, everything becomes more systematic. Yeah. Okay. And so we will have one month or so in order to deal with all these. So you are considering translating other courses into Portuguese. 
Um, Proper Portuguese, not that other Portuguese. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, and again, we are talking from the translation that we have done, uh, yeah. we are talking about high quality Portuguese, okay? Because sometimes you are talking about the language that is not a language like Brazilian, okay? Brazilian is, so if there's any is not a language here. I'm sorry, but Lewis is Portuguese, Portuguese, oh, and yeah. very patriotic about his language, <laughs> just like the British are about our English. Unfortunately, I think we've kind of half lost the battle with our American cousins. I do still get people in the UK mutter about spellings and pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a router is something you bore holes into a wall with. That's all I'm going to say, my American cousins. <laughs> but yeah, it's important to get the translation right in the local dialect because it's yeah. it's about school teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And school Absolutely. teachers are teaching young people. And I mean, we have, do we have the same problems in the UK? No. However, for you, you're trying to teach a help a teacher that's teaching a 14 to 18 yeah, year old yeah, and their grasp of English is still emergent yeah. um, but they've got to learn through the artifice of their own language their natural language which is Portuguese yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. got to be right not yeah. slightly right I mean, no, 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 it's no, got no. to be really correct yeah absolutely so yeah. we joke about Brazilian Portuguese but that really isn't the language they know at all Absolutely. Yeah. And we are, yeah, when we are talking about the Portuguese education system, yes, we must be talking about Portuguese, okay, written and, and, and written in this case, okay. And when we are talking about Brazilian, Brazilian translation to Brazilian, okay, we are really talking about very different sentences and the way we are, we sometimes we express ourselves. Yeah. The English. British English and American English are probably closer. Yeah, America. closer. Yeah, we, we have closer. very yeah some words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, minor changes but when we're we talking about. Each yeah, yeah, other. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm joking. Whereas you're you're saying that syntactical context is quite different. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When you look at a sentence in Portuguese and the sentence of that same content in Brazilian, you immediately say that okay, <laughs> this is. <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. yeah. This has been automatic translated to Brazilian, which is not a language. Okay, so, but yeah. yes, okay, of course yeah, you understand I very well. But it's not for the his same patriotism, <laughs> if we've got any Brazilians here, but he's entitled to be patriotic about it, as I am patriotic about <laughs> British English. Yeah, 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 even, yeah. Even though yeah. I am very, very happy to work with Cisco NetCAD resources, I still, after 25 years, get people mutter about about certain spellings or use of words. But here we are. As uh, Winston Churchill said, Amer America and England, a two, two nations divided by a common language. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's more or less the correct quote from Winston Churchill. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds yeah. like Brazil and Portugal are a bit more than divided on this now. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah, so, but yeah, but that means that, yeah, this translation in particular is probably one of the most, not difficult, but with with some more hard work than probably the usual, okay. Of course, that if we are talking also about Spanish or something, probably we have the same problem, of course, Yeah. but, uh, but not when we are talking about translation like the one you, you have mentioned, I believe. So I'm just messaging Susie Lee. So Susie Lee, I've just sent you a message on WhatsApp. Just doing a little bit of practical admin, because I'd like to suggest that we take a brief break, everybody, and then hand over to Susie Lee in 15 minutes time. Does that work for you, Susie Lee? Bear with me, everybody. She's, she, she's about 50 miles away from me. So you, I've got to rely on different technologies to communicate. Certainly, thank you very much, Susan Lee, that's perfect. So what we're going to do is pause everything and take a 15 minute comfort break. It's 13 past three now. So I'll say, let's make it 
half past three or 15.30 UK time, we will recommence. Okay, thank you all very much. Did I find the right thing to mute us at this end? Okay, I will now it.
So hello everyone, we're about two minutes before we restart. So I'm just going to do the usual check if everybody's alive by getting you to type into the chat hello or kopla or hola. Mm. And if you know what kopla means. It's going on. There you go, see? <laughs> and cling on for. Hi, hello. I well, don't know. in Klingon, they don't they have don't, either, no, don't know. But you're right. Really. It means be well. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to check it out. So one of my exercises, sorry, and it, it is being broadcast at the moment. One of my exercises I did for my students, this is a long time ago. I actually got them to build a very basic Klingon to English <laughs> transit later using the Klingon Language Institute as a reference source. <laughs> and I got, I think it was JavaScript. It might be more web dev courses, but and it, yeah, it was amazing how they ran off. And <laughs> did it. You know, not so nerdy was like, actually, this is quite funny. Yeah. Patak, Cliff. Uh, it, as I say, you don't need to be a nerd to be in computing, but I can assure you it helps, Jason. <laughs> it does, it does. <laughs> Sorry, it's, 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 a, it's a running joke for those of you. Um, Susie Lee, are you back with us yet? Because obviously you've probably going off and having a, a pint of tea. Yes, I'm here. Oh, excellent. It's great to hear your voice as well. Susan Lee, can everybody else hear Susan Lee's voice? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Oh, we can hear you, <laughs> one, two, three. And Ambrose has said yes. So why I do that is just to check it's not just us and that it's everybody else. It may seem trivial, but we all know what it's like um, with... Um, internet technologies these days. So you may share your camera if you wish, Susan Lee, and you may share your screen when you're ready and start at any moment. Hello, Susan Lee, it's good to Hi. see you. Hi. Yeah, All right. and Jason so is hiding schools... in the corner there. Make yes. a noise, Jason. I am hiding. <laughs> Jason will appear in a second. And we've got uh, Lewis and Innes. So nice to introduce... You introduce you from our context um susan lee is one of our partners in crime and is a study <laughs> advisor on the python micro credential that jason and i spoke about early today and the rest is over to you susan lee you may introduce yourself you may explain what you're doing who you are and everything else to everyone in this forum over to you all right lovely thank you so much andrew um, no, as you are aware, I'm Susie Lee, and I've been teaching computer science for over 17 years now. I, well, like, based on my accent, I guess maybe you can think that I'm from the Caribbean and migrated here almost four years ago. Um, no, what I'm about to present is basically how I teach Python within the classroom. All right, um, I started out in Jamaica where what we taught there for year nine, 10, 11 was Pascal. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Pascal. Um, so may I cut across you? I banned Pascal in a national <laughs> qualification in the UK for legal reasons. Legally, it was so out of date. But it's <laughs> lovely to know that Pascal was still knocking around somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, so as you can guess, the nightmare of students having to remember to place um, semicolon at the end of each line, um, that was their major error. No, I was introduced to Python um, about six months, interestingly, before I came to the UK. And ever since, I've not let go right because python is easier for students to grasp now with my college let me share my screen here my college here where i am um the Sale studio college we start at year nine 
and go, we go all the way up to year 13. So I'm going to give you the whole gist of it. Now, we offer, we're like a business institution for year nine to 13. And I am the only computer science teacher here. So that means I have total autonomy in how the subject is delivered, right? So what I choose to do is to use Python for year nine straight up to year 13. So by year 13, those who have been with me from year nine, they fully master Python. Well, I wouldn't say fully because they are always new, um, new ideas and new um, stuff to learn about Python. Now for year nines and 10, I focus on computational thinking and that includes converting algorithm to Python when we get to the end. So students learn how to decompose. Now, what I do to try to get my students interested in Python itself or in programming in general is to show them or to wow them with the big stuff. So they might see a game that was created using Python integrated with PyCharm or Pygame and they say, wow. And they might then begin though, can I do that? And I tell them, yes, and that is the truth. They can do that. But what they need to then understand is that they have to start from the basics. And that's where I begin, from a simple hello world to learning how to input their name or different data types so that they're able to manipulate different sorts of data. Now, what have helped me over the past two and a half years, I signed up with the Net with Cisco NetAcad. And they have given me the opportunity to enable my students to learn Python on their own. It's like a curriculum away from my curriculum. Good. And they can learn anywhere. All right. So each term, I give them a course from the Cisco NetAcad to complete. Now, in year nine, all students, um, I make it a requirement for them to complete the Python essentials so that when it comes to my specification, I follow the OCR specification, and these are some bits that we do. Good. And all these Python allow. All right. So by the time they complete their Python essentials with Cisco and I am ready for them, then the knowledge can be transferred much easier using the same um, theory, theory, um, mental model theory, where when a content is introduced um, and then they have that previous knowledge, then the content will stick more. So thank you again, Andrew, for introducing me to um, Cisco NetAcad. It's okay, I take no responsibility anymore. <laughs> All right, now for the for year 11s, um, they would have already completed the computational thinking and converting simple algorithms to Python. Now, why I ask them to convert the algorithm to Python is for them to get the, the grasp, the skill of actually coding in Python, because in their exam at the end of year 11, they must be able to use a high level language. That's what OCR says, and they give a list of different language languages, but I choose to stick to Python. I do encourage students to, you know, go out there and explore. Some of them do, some don't. But my thing is that I want them to be advanced and fully developed within a programming language and I chose Python. Um, so year 11, we go into string manipula manipulation, file handling, list, functions and procedures. And um, object oriented programming is not so much on the list for year 11s, but I do introduce the more advanced students to it. Good. Now for year 12, we also include object-oriented programming for them 
because they have to learn object oriented programming for exam purposes and for completing their programming project, which is 20% of their overall grade. So we focus on algorithms and they must know how to create these algorithms, searching and sorting algorithms. They must also be able to identify a particular algorithm. Now, when it comes to year 13 and their programming project, many of them choose to use Python in combination with um, Pygame to create amazing projects. Um, this is the OCR A-level computer science part of the specification where object-oriented programming is incorporated. And this is perfect for Python. Everything that is here is done in Python. Use of classes, objects, methods, attributes, um, inheritance, all these are done using Python. Now, as I said before, that my, my school is a secondary school. We call it a, it's a studio model. So right now, I think all of England is on midterm break, but I am still here at school. We start at nine, we finish at five. So we have business subjects, and these are the ways which I allow my students to implement their knowledge of Python within the wider curriculum. So we offer the subject retail, and they have used Python to create a random name generator for Valentine's date. This was pretty interesting. Um, for business studies, they have created an order system, and these are students who both do computer science and business. Retail, business, all business subjects are compulsory here. So we try to do an integrated curriculum. For criminology, they created the verdict giver based on real life cases incorporated within the code. And we also have a computing club where we again use Python now, here in England, we have, I don't know if it's available otherwise, but we have access to, to BBC um, microbits where students can actually manipulate how the data is presented on the microbit. So here you have a heart, you can have a smiley face, and they do the coding in Python. All right. Here, they love to use turtle graphics. Anything that has to do with graphics and anything being drawn onto the screen, they love that. So I try to use or incorporate these fun bits into clubs and also into lesson so that learning is consolidated. Now, there are vast amount of resources out there for Python. These are just a few. Now, one one other aspect that I encourage my, especially my year 13s to do and year 12s is to download um, Python IDE on their smartphones. It's available for Android and it's available for, um, for iPhone so that on the go they can practice. Because as I keep on tell, tell them, if you, if you don't use it, you will lose it. So that's a synopsis of what I do as a computer science teacher. I hope you have, I don't know, are there any other computer science teachers here? You're, you're in a room full of them, Susan Lee. Secondary school, secondary okay. school. Are there any secondary school teachers? Um, so if so, say hi. Yes, excellent. I mean, we've, we've got the wide range here. A few, few things has already fascinated me and a couple of observations. Mm -hmm. Firstly, well done for mentioning Pygame, because Jason and I brought that up in the morning session and we discussed how that is a really good way of getting students engaged. They love yes. the graphics. Does it turn them into gaming experts? No. Does it develop their coding skills? Yes. Definitely. Is it available on Raspberry Pis? Of course it is. So it's it's a great um I used when I used to teach programming many years ago in a further education college, I used to use games in Java and then some of you may remember Flash and Action Script. 
even though that is dead and defunct, it was a good way of getting those that were struggling with programming to learn to programming because they actually did something they could see and they needed the visual metaphor to do that. So sort of thanks for that observation. Susan Lee, you've said that you've mapped to um, OCR, GCSE and A-level standards. Yes. How close the mapping would you say that the Open EDG Cisco Netacad Python content is? It's, it's pretty close. Um, like 80% of the terminology, I see it coming across to the OCR um, specification. So as when I give my students the course to complete on NetaCAD and I am teaching, then the same terminologies are intertwined. OK, so you just got to maybe fill the gaps as a teacher, but there are not many gaps. Uh, no, there are not many gaps. Ex excellent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a loaded question now. Mm -hmm. Is it making your life easier to use the OpenEDG Python content? Yes, it is. And Why? it's um, I think I think it's holistic because even if for OCR there there are specific terminologies that the students have to use, if you on open EDG use at uh, uses another terminology that opens their horizon or broaden their horizon because they're going out there in, into the world of work where other persons will know other terminologies. So they need to be aware as well. So it takes them away from the academic view of computer science into a little bit more of an employability industry yes. focus. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So would you mind sometime having a call with Elizabeth and I from Cisco to share your experiences of OCR um, integration? Because I think there's a lot of people that could learn from you. And at this point, did you hear I that? I am back. I am back. OK, you did freeze very briefly there. So I was asking, would you be happy to share some of your experiences with our Cisco contact in the UK? Because we'd like to learn from you. Yes, most definitely. Oh, uh, that was the answer I was looking for anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I was going to say, don't worry about your Caribbean um, accent. I'm 33 years out of Somerset. And I still haven't I've dropped my West Country accent. So, yeah, it's a good accent to have. Mm, thank you. Well, it's the only way you've got to look at it because you've got no choice, as I've got no choice. Um, anybody got any questions for Susie Lee? I can see a question here from Debbie. Can you see that? OK, it was more of an observation. So what you're doing is creating an integrated approach to teaching. Yes. yes. How common is that? Uh, it's well, I'm not sure of other organizations within the UK, but this is my first since I'm here. And this is what we emphasize here at the Salis. OK, so you're 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 teaching coding for the sake of coding, but then you're teaching coding with the, some relevant practical application. Yes, yes. With real world scenarios. Mm -hmm. that, that scenario where you've got that Valentine's, um, look up, and this is this is a correct thing, look up correct horse battery staple. Yeah, Jason knows what I'm on. Correct horse battery. It's a good way of developing passwords mm -hmm. and having multiple names or random words for passwords is also a thing as well. So you could actually link what you're doing for Valentine's to cybersecurity. Yes, yes. Yeah, because yes. it's, a, it's a random, because it, 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 what people are trying to learn these days is not passwords, it's mm -hmm. pass phrases. And why I say correct horse battery staple, it's actually the name of a well-known comic, XKCD. Um, and you might find that that's actually quite interesting in teaching a little bit about cyber security at the same awesome. time. And you're already doing the activity. You're just it's, it's, it's twisting it very slightly differently. So we've talked about the part the micro bit is available in Portugal, which is cool. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I'm up for any technology. You use a Raspberry Pi and Arduino, a micro bit, or a Beagle board, or whatever. We don't care. Um, Susan Lee, would you mind putting, are you happy to share your email knowing that at least 600 people might spam you tomorrow? Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll test the Salas' spam bot. And I think that's important. And yeah, and I think it is about sharing experience and collaboration. Yes, yes. I mean, we, when I first took the Salas on board and Susan Lee jo- yeah, joined and set up the academy, it was very much us showing you what you could do. You've done all the work. You decided how you can leverage it and you've mm-hmm. done some great stuff with it. And that's what I like about NetAcad. We do not dictate what you do. We just say, here is what we've got. It's open to you about how you can make good use of it. And Susan Lee is a fantastic example of somebody in an organisational context that's done great work with um, the Open EDG NetAcad resources and linking it to nationally recognised qualifications in the UK. Has anybody else got any more questions? Or observations? Now, I think we've stunned everybody into silence now, haven't we? And also, it's getting close to four o'clock, where most people need to have their, um, yeah, re- yeah, af- afternoon break. Okay, Susie Lee, thank you very much for your contribution. It's been a really great help. Um, we're now pretty much running to the end of this session because we had one person quite uh, realistically drop out because she had another commitment imposed upon her. Um, But what I will say to everybody is we're actually going to set this up and share the recording, share it on the course. The recording will be shared in about seven days once the translations have been done into Portuguese and Spanish. But I think now you've got all four of us. You've got Jason, Inez, Lewis and myself. And I think it will be good to just open this up for any questions. So we're going to keep an eye on the chat now. And if you want to ask a question, now is a good time to ask it. Otherwise, we're going to shut down at 4 p.m. Of course, if you want to go, it's good to see you, Debbie. A few names I do recognise here. I think it's been very well attended. I think the question I have for everybody is, based on what you've learned today, would you use the Open EDG to teach your students? The Open EDG Python content, should I say? Obrigado, yes. Bom dia. (laughs) Yes, he clarified in the recording that it's currently available on the Python Institute site or will become available, shall I say. And they're in very positive conversations with Kamara and Giuseppe at NetAcad. Thank you, Debbie. No, it's our pleasure. And uh, yeah, our, our hope is, yeah, as I said, the question goes, if you can make more of this content or explore some of the other code, coding content. We're not wedded to Python. It's just that Python's the main focus of um, this current um, webinar. Now, if you end up using the JavaScript content or the C++ content, um, we, we, we are happy. And it's about you utilizing the resources for the benefit of your students. That, that will be very positive. And Russell, uh, we would love to hear from you if you can email me and we just chat about you know, which sort of community you work in in Canada and whether we can come, become, yeah, in orbit indirectly, a little bit more involved as an ASC as well. We are picking up academies in North America. 
and yeah, maybe yeah, we're we're free, look at how we can actually work with your academy, and yeah, find some cr yeah cr cross ocean collegiate opportunities, some transatlantic experience. So, any final words from you, Jason? None. None whatsoever. <laughs> I apologise for my talkative <laughs> colleague. Lewis, any final words from the president of NC? <laughs> no, no, just to repeat what you, are, you have said. So uh, if you, it, 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 it's really important for us to get feedback for all the attendees with respect to how they see that we and what we are doing can help them in what they are doing, okay? And so feel free to contact us, not only by email, but also through our forum in the, the, in the platform and so on, because from our side, we will keep in touch because we really love to, to explore opportunities together with all of you and to share everything that we we are, uh, are doing and will do in the next in the next uh, few years. Okay. Yes, and I will reiterate that. So we are sending out surveys. Um, this has been funded by Erasmus Plus. Please, when we send out surveys, complete the surveys because data is everything when we speak to funders. And obviously, we want to make sure that this program lasts beyond this project. And keeping a funder happy to keep you happy is the name of the game. And we're learning a great deal from this process as well, which is great. And we've developed some resources already that we've shared with you in the um, NetAcad um, forum. And if we see more of you teaching coding using any of these resources, as I've said a number of times, then we will feel that this will be a success in us. Anything you would like to say as a final word? Uh, yes, I would like to recommend people to watch Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of person. <laughs> yeah, so the Star Trek course, which is starting soon. <laughs> yes, and if, if you do not watch any of a Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan <laughs> is your starting point. Okay. <laughs> On that, thank you all very much. It's almost the top of the hour, which is fine. It's been great. And we will um, end here and just let everybody say goodbye and shut down in a couple of minutes. We're going to mute.